I've always been a writer. Um, I enjoyed writing assignments when I was in school. I was the weird kid in high school who loved it if an English teacher assigned a research paper because I enjoyed putting my thoughts on paper, researching, learning about new topics, and organizing them. Um, in junior high, I actually had some poems published in a junior high anthology of poetry. Um, my first novel was written about the time I was in junior high. I don't still have it, but it was an adventure. Um, I'm the original horse crazy girl, and it was a, a novel about a girl living on a ranch in the West. Um, I, in the days before internet, I loved writing letters home. I've, I lived far away from my family and I always loved writing home and trying to make those letters interesting. And I've done other kinds of writing um, all my life as well. I've helped edit and uh, founded actually a women's newsletter in one church that I used to go to. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of writing I've enjoyed. One of my jobs, I had to write a church's annual report. Um, not extremely creative, and yet I even enjoyed that kind of writing. So it really is something I've always done. But I didn't think about writing fiction until I was homeschooling my children and it came time to do the fourth grade Nebraska history mm -hmm. lessons and my learning about the state of Nebraska and the history and uh, meeting some of the pioneer women and wondering what their lives were like and learning what their lives were like I really came to admire them and uh, I started what I call playing with imaginary friends, just kind of writing sent scenes in the life of a woman who might have, have lived in Nebraska in the early 1800s, late 1800s. And that eventually kind of took on a life of its own and ended up being my first novel, Walks the Fire. I don't think that I would probably be a novelist if I hadn't moved to Nebraska because it was the history of this state, um, having an elderly neighbor who told me that he'd been born in a sod house, and re reading about women who had survived losing several children, and just hearing stories was the thing that really sparked my imagination. So I probably wouldn't be a novelist today if I hadn't moved to Nebraska. My mother was a huge influence. My mother was not an educated woman. She had to drop out of school when she was in eighth grade. She did not have a high school education, but she educated herself by reading. My mother was a prolific reader, and you don't always pass that on to all of your children, but my mother passed that on to me. One of my earliest memories from childhood is of her reading to me. Um, I think she read me Pinocchio when I was sick one time, and that captured me and brought me into the world of fiction and so my mother was definitely an influence and a Nebraska writer who actually um, this year her book is the one book uh, one Lincoln choice best streeter Aldrich I discovered her books because I worked at a church supper one night with one of Mrs. Aldrich's next, next her next door neighbor it was a very elderly woman and we were talking and I said I love to read I love to read and she said oh you should read some of my neighbors books and not being from Nebraska I had never heard of Best Reader Aldrich but I looked up a book and I read it and I now own all of her books I reread them frequently I just love the way she tells a story and I know that she was very instrumental in my wanting to tell pioneer women's stories um, beyond that any other novelist. I, I have a goal of reading a book a week and so I'm constantly reading a lot of other fiction and it's very inspiring. I think it's just a creative outlet for me um, and a way of paying tribute because I like to write about pioneer women. Um, I also like to write about people who've overcome a lot, a hard time or a personal challenge. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know why that's the outlet that I choose. Other people choose music or uh, design or other th artwork, painting, but for me it's, it's the word thing, probably because I've read all my life and I love words. They fascinate me. Even as a child, I always wanted to know the names of things. Um, my mother was a gardener and I wasn't happy with knowing that was a white flower. I wanted to know the name of the white flower. And I'm that way today when I, when I travel, I drive taxi cab drivers crazy because I'm always asking her, her or him, what's the name of that tree blooming? And they never know, but I want to know the names. <laughs> so I'm still a word person, probably always will be.
There's a quote from a man named Peter DeVries. A lot of writers, they talk about how, how do you decide your work day and do you wait for inspiration to strike? A lot of people will ask writers that. And I love this quote. It's, I only write when I'm inspired and I make sure that I'm inspired at 9 o'clock every morning. <laughs> so there's always that balance between feeling inspired about something and yet having the work to do um, because it's my full-time job. So I need to do it whether I feel inspired or not. Um, but again, I go back to the same themes. I, I constantly am reading nonfiction, um, historical events, things about what the early setter, settlers experienced. I'll read nonfiction about a given event. And I never know when I'm going to find some little tidbit that I'm going to stop and think, wow, what would that have been like? Or how did she manage that? And then I start thinking, what if, what if, what if, what if? And many times those little bunny trails that I'll take will end up being something that I do want to write about. But I'm, I'm not really interested in spending a lot of time with how hard life is unless I can balance that with an overcoming and a triumph over the hard times and leave readers with a message of hope. Um, there's, there's nothing mysterious about the writing that I do. It's meant to be entertaining. It's meant to give people a place to run away to, uh, a bit of escape, and a guarantee that there will be a happy ending in this book. And I think that has a purpose in life. Life is hard. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of trials and a lot of tough times, and I think it's, it's good to be part of the world that gives them a little bit of an escape from that, and yet not escaping from traditional themes or from internal themes like in my work, I want to reassure people there is a God and He does love you and He is paying attention and He does have a plan because we all go through times when we wonder, <laughs> could that possibly be true? And so I want that to be an encouraging part of my book as well. But overall, leave people with a message of hope and a happy ending and, and feeling good about what they've read, that, they, that they've had a good time. And they've been taken someplace that... Uh, that they couldn't have gone in any other way except through a flight of fancy. I think I do have a unique voice, but it's not something that I consciously created or adapted. Um, when I very first got my very first contract, my editor at the time actually told me she didn't want me reading any other fiction for a while. And I asked her why, and she said, because you have a unique voice, but I don't think you're aware of it yet and I don't want you trying to copy the writers that you admire. I want you to work and develop your own voice. So about two books into my writing career, I actually disobeyed her, and I started to read someone else's novel. And we were chatting one day, and I said to her, you know, this is a really good book. But I realized as I was reading this scene that I would not have expressed it that way. I would not have written it that way. And she said, okay now you can start reading other people's fiction because you know how you want to say things and you've got a sense of it. But it's not really um, a fabricated thing. I think it's just something that all writers develop over time as a process of the work. There's a, just a natural outgrowth. So. I would probably steal advice from Stephen King. Um, he says there are two things that you need to do if you want to be a writer. You need to read a lot and you need to write a lot. Um, I don't know if there's a magic formula, but those are both very good advice, at least in my experience. Reading a lot informs me in my language skills. It helps me. I think reading other people's work has actually developed, helped me develop my own voice because I know I don't want to say it that way. Obviously, writing a lot, is, writing is just one of those crafts that you learn it by doing. And it's the self-discipline to sit down at the empty chair, uh, in the empty chair, and face that blank screen and fill it with words. And know that the first words that you put on that blank screen are probably going to be thrown away. Or they're going to be rewritten so many times that they're not even going to be recognizable. But you have to have something to start with. So you have to put the words on the screen. And so that's what I would tell people, read a lot and write a lot. As far as the publication part of it, I will always be a writer whether I'm always published or not, is completely out of my hands. You know, being a writer is the craziest job. It's the only job I know of that whether or not you get to keep it has very little to do with whether you're good at it or not. The one thing that keeps a writer working 
is sales. And that is the one thing that most writers can't do very much about. So it's a very humbling profession <laughs> to be a writer. So I go back to what can I do? I can make the writing better. That's the one thing. And over and over again, if I, as I've asked publishers over the, the span of my career, what can I do to help you? What can we do about this or that problem? And they always say, just write us a really good book. So that's what I tell people. Now we all hear that it's very, very difficult to get published. And I'm sure it is very difficult to get published, especially maybe it's getting harder now. But then every once in a while you hear this amazing story about that, this person who sold their very first book to this incredibly huge publisher. And those stories still happen. That's how I got published in 95. I, got, I was published, my first publisher, and I did not know this at the time or I never would have sent them a query letter, but they were the largest Christian publishing house in the world. They bought three books and they had not yet read one finished book. So if that can happen to me, a homemaker with four kids from nowhere, Nebraska, who's never been published, who doesn't have an agent, who doesn't know anything about the publishing industry, that can happen to anybody. Um, the thing is the writing. That's what you can have control over. So I would just say just keep working and don't give up. Don't get discouraged. If you have a heart for that, keep doing it. Also define success. Is success to you only if you get published? Or is it if you're sharing your gift? Because there are a lot of different ways to share the gift of writing that you have with the people around you and to enrich other people's lives without getting paid for the words. I do. I have my, my book um, that comes out next month is called A Claim of Her Own. It's about um, a woman gold prospector in Deadwood, South Dakota, which if you know anything about Deadwood, South Dakota during the gold rush was not a very good place to put a single woman, but my gal is. And so that's um, next month. And the next year's book will be about single women homesteading in western Nebraska. Women's history is a, a rather new discipline in the academic world and more and more is being discovered about women's history. And one of the things that I'm learning about is that there were a lot of single women who homesteaded on the Great Plains. And so I thought that would be fun to put some single gals out there. And so that's the next book. And then I always have something that I'm working on that isn't under contract and I have, I think I have four books at different stages of development right now. Uh, one book of my heart is, my working title for it is called, it's Nebraska's Sod House Homemakers and Their Quilts. And it's a nonfiction book that I'm going to propose. Um, a research partner, Kathy Moore, and I have been working on it for mm, several years now. But it's meant to pay tribute to Nebraska's Sod House Homemakers. And we're going to take a look at some of the quilts that we know were used in sod houses. So that's a project that's very near and dear to my heart because it's a way of saying, hey, look at these amazing women and what they did. And this reading is actually the 181st reading of the John A. James reading series, so we're glad you're here. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection that's dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. And currently there are about 13,000 volumes uh, representative collection here in the room and there are about 3,000 authors who are represented as well. And we also do have information files, uh, magazines, pictures, obviously artwork on the walls if you look around a little bit too, and other memorabilia from various Nebraska authors. So we do invite you to come back and visit the Heritage Room when we're open for public service hours. Actually we're open right now from 2 to 5 on Sunday afternoons and also on Tuesdays through Fridays from 12 to 3. Um, if you are watching this on Five City TV, instead of sitting here in the room, I just want you to know that this room is on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library in downtown Lincoln, 14th and N Streets. And we'd also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. We're able to bring special programs like this through an endowment established through their volunteer efforts. Our reader today is Stephanie Grace Whitson. And though she was born in Southern Illinois, she's lived in Nebraska, I think, for more than 35 years, maybe? Quite a, f to check the math here. 
Um, spending all those years in the state and homeschooling her children led to her interest in Nebraska history, as I understand it, and especially the lives of pioneer women. Those interests are definitely reflected in her writing, as she published her first novel in 1995, Walks the Fire, part of the Prairie Wind series. Over the years, her fiction titles have appeared on the ECPA bestseller list numerous times. And one of her most recent stories is entitled Unbridled Dreams, focusing on a young woman who wants more than anything to appear in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Let's see what else she has for us today. If you could help me welcome her, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be asked to participate in this. Um, I was saying earlier that it was a long time before I could tell people when they asked me what I did for a living that I was a writer and not laugh when I said that because I grew up reading great literature by people like Willa Cather and um, all the great writers, uh, Charles Dickens and people like that. And so I'm a storyteller. And that's a different kind of writing. And sometimes you feel a little bit apologetic about that. But I'm finally grown up now. I turned 57 last month. And now I realize that there's room for me in the world of writing as well. And being invited to come to do something like this is one of those affirming things that I really appreciate. The kind of writing that I do, I said I'm a storyteller. That's what Best Streeter Aldrich always said about herself when she was asked to compare herself to Willa Cather. She always said, Miss Cather writes literature. I'm a storyteller. And uh, that's kind of the difference between me and a lot of other literary fiction authors. Um, I won't be on Oprah, and Mel Gibson won't star in the film version. <laughs> darn. Um, but I'm a storyteller, and I'm working on story number 19 now at home, so I think I'm, I'm stuck in this vocation. My first vocation has always been homemaker and mom, but I don't think I ever would have been a writer for publication had I not moved to Nebraska. I moved here in 1975, and one of the very first things that happened that led me down this road of wanting to tell the story of Nebraska's history and Nebraska's mighty women, I like to call them, was a neighbor who was an elderly gentleman who has since gone on to the next life who was talking with my husband one day out on the driveway and chatting, saying that he had been born in a sod house. I was fascinated by the idea of living in a sod house. Well, Mr. Knox was not. He said that he hoped that filthy old thing had fallen in by now, and that was pretty much the end of the conversation. But that planted a seed of curiosity in my brain. I didn't really do much with that seed of curiosity until I was teaching my kids their fourth grade history, Nebraska history. And at the time, we lived on an acreage in southeast Nebraska. And uh, you know, the best way to bore the average kid with American history is to hand them the typical Nebraska or any history textbook because the textbook writers have the duty to impart the dates and the names and the places and sometimes they forget that it's the story of individual people. And so I was quite horrified because I've always loved American history that my kids thought Nebraska history was boring. So one day, kind of in desperation, I said, let's go down the road to the cemetery. We lived at the end of a gravel road where the bridge was out with a bunch of wooded acreage, but there was an abandoned pioneer cemetery on the corner where you would turn to go to our home. So we went down there and I started asking the kids questions about the people buried in that cemetery. Questions like, let's find the oldest grave. All right, the oldest grave is from this year. How many of these trees in this cemetery were here when Mrs. King was passed away and was buried here? The answer was none, because there were no trees there big enough to have been a hundred and some years old. So my kids started studying the people who were buried in that cemetery. We came to the archives. We did some research. We met some of the people in the neighborhood who were actually living on one of the old homesteads, found out that the middle of their house was the original house. And my children got out of the dates and the names and all of that and more into the stories of the lives of the people. 
And I had no idea that that would also end up capturing my imagination. But at some point along in that year of homeschooling, I started what I call playing with an imaginary friend. And she didn't have a name yet, but she was a pioneer woman. And I, the things that I learned with my children about Nebraska history, about the Oregon Trail and the Lakota Indians and Fort Kearney and being a laundress, what did women do at the fort? Often they were laundresses and what that entailed ended up being chapters in the life of an imaginary woman because I'm one of those people that I've always written. I've always enjoyed writing. And so I was just, like I said, entertaining myself in my spare time with my four kids and my home-based home base business that I was running. Um, and it kind of took on a life of itself. I knew that I should put it away because I needed to run this home-based business and help my husband pay some bills, but I just couldn't seem to put it away. So one day I decided, well, I know how this publishing thing works. You send out a query letter and you get a rejection. And that's just how that works. So I thought, I'm going to do that. I came right here to the Bennett Martin Library downstairs, and I pulled off a book called The Writer's Market, and I picked out three publishers who would take unagented submissions from unpublished people in the Christian world of writing because my faith informs my writing. And I sent off three query letters and I dismissed that whole thing from my mind. But I got a letter back from one of those publishers and they wanted to see some sample chapters, which I had, so I sent those off. And I forgot about it again because after all, the end of this is going to be rejection. I'm just waiting for the handwriting on the wall to say, put this away and raise your children. So um, months later, this one publisher hadn't given up yet, and they were asking for a finished book, which I did not have. The whole point of this being I don't have time to write a book, right? Um, so in panic, I called a friend of mine who had published some magazine articles and said, what do I do? And she said, how long will it take you to finish the book? I said, probably six weeks. I know what happens. Um, I just have to, I haven't put the words down. Well, take the six weeks, finish the book, send it to the publisher. Well, six weeks came and went, and the business had started to grow, and I still didn't have a finished book. So, again, they're going to reject it, right? Why should I stay up until 3 in the morning finishing it? I'll finish it someday for my grandchildren. So, idiot that I was, in my ignorance, I sent them what I had, which was, uh, most of a book, probably about two-thirds, It beginning, ending, more dramatic scenes, they would come to a chapter that said, I haven't written this yet, but this is what I think happens. I tell this story to encourage anybody who's watching or anybody in this room who thinks that you can't get published. You can. Um, sometimes even all the mistakes that you make work out and you end up. I ended up with a three-book contract from the largest Christian publisher in the world, which I never would have sent a query letter to had I known they were the largest Christian publisher in the world. I found that out about two years later. Somebody stopped me and went, you do know that your publisher, yada, 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 yada. And I went, oh, you're kidding. I had no idea. So that's my publishing story. Um, and God bless that. And it sold well enough that I got the next contract. And that was 1994, 1995, and here I am working on project number 18 or 19 and with three or four more. The thing that amazed me as a storyteller, and one of the reasons that I knew that I was kind of meant to do this, I just didn't really have anything to say until I was about 50, <laughs> was that um, that first contract when it came really frightened me. And I remember saying to my husband, I don't know if I can write three books. I haven't even written one book yet. Of course, in his practical mind, he said, they're paying you money, sign the contract. <laughs> so I did, and we closed the home-based business. But I think I was always meant to do this, because as I've researched the different stories, I've never lost my passion for Nebraska's pioneer women. I've never run out of stories that I want to tell. I have a big fat folder at home now that is full of ideas of bunny trails that I've discovered in other research. So sometimes people ask, where do you get all those ideas? Because you say you have this big fat file folder, and I can't imagine ever, ever thinking of a story that would end up as a book-length manuscript. 
The way it works for me is I am always reading nonfiction. I have a huge library at home, and if you were to look in my office now, which is an old um, oak library table, that's the desk that I work at. And um, at the moment, there are two piles of books right here to the right of my computer that are waiting to be read, and they're both about this high. And in fact, when I leave here today, I have to renew a couple because I just got a notice that they're overdue at the library. Um, and I just read, and every once in a while, a story will grab me, and I will just stop and think, what would that have been like? Or how did she feel going through that? Um, and an example is I was reading one time, actually reading a microfilm version of a newspaper, an old Grand Island, Nebraska newspaper. I was researching another book, trying to find out what did meals cost at the hotel and what did they eat and how did they celebrate weddings and things like that. And there was just two paragraphs in the newspaper that said, um, the German club in Grand Island, I believe the year was 1888, had decided that there weren't enough German-speaking women in the area, and they had pooled their money and sent home to Germany for women. And 40 came. And they lined up in the church or the town hall or wherever it was, and they married complete strangers. And the rule was they had to spend the first night in Grand Island so that if any of the women changed their mind, their marriage could be annulled the next morning. <laughs> but then they went home with complete strangers. And that just stopped me dead in my tracks, because I thought, all the questions that I know you're thinking, we could make a list if this were a writing class. Why would a woman do that? Why would she come and marry a complete stranger? How did that work out? And for me, I started the what if, what if, what if, what if, and that became one of my novels, one of my early ones. It's called Karin's Memory Box. So I'm constantly reading nonfiction, constantly learning about the little things about Nebraska history that sometimes would bore somebody else, but I find these little nuggets and I want to follow them. And one day again, I was at the Nebraska State Archives in the research room, and I had made an appointment to see some of the bigger, the more refined versions of the Solomon Butcher photographs of the Sod House era. And Solomon Butcher was a photographer who at the end of the 19th century realized that a very essential part of American history was disappearing. And he mounted his photography studio on the back of a wagon and went around the Sand Hills in Custer County, Nebraska, photographing pictures of families and their sod houses. And that was one of the first things about Nebraska history that amazed me. I bought John Carter's book about that topic, and I would sit for hours and look at those pictures and wonder what was that life like. Well, I'm involved in a nonfiction project right now documenting some of the quilts that were used in some of those sod houses because I'd like to do a tribute book to those women who lived there through the quilts that they had in those soddies. So I was headed downstairs um, at the archives to look at the big files on the server, the ones that are really fancy where you can see all kinds of detail that you can't usually see um, if you just look in the book. And on the way down, one of the researchers there turned around and said, you would love to meet a lady that I just learned about. And of course, we're talking about dead people, right? But to us, we're history people, so they're not quite gone. And I said, tell me about her. And she said, oh, she was a trick roper for Buffalo Bill's Wild West. She was a sharpshooter. She did vaudeville, um, all these amazing things. And she did an endurance ride by herself, her, her horse, and her dog from San Francisco to New York City. She was in a race. And I kind of went, that sounds like quite a woman. And I said, what do we have of hers? And Linda said, we have her scrapbooks. And I said, don't put them away. <laughs> I'll be back. So the following Monday morning, I went back down and I sat her name was Nan Aspinwall, and um, the, today in the room I've laid out some pictures. There's the newspaper article that talks about her endurance ride, and there are some photographs of Nan who inspired the book that I'm going to read to you from called Unbridled Dreams. And I thought, what an amazing story. Buffalo Bill's Wild West, at the end of the 1800s, he did have women who traveled and performed with him, and 
what would that have been like? And as I have said many times, I'm the original horse crazy girl, so the idea of having a Western gal was great. And I didn't really honestly want to have to learn about how to do trick roping. And I know a little bit about horses. And so I made my character, um, Liberty Bell, a trick rider. Also because I know horse people who could read the parts of my manuscript that involve riding and tell me, is this right? Is this how this horse would behave in this situation? And am I having her do un impossible things? Because I've seen trick riders in rodeos when I was a child, but I had to do it from memory. And so she became a trick rider. And those are some of the things that I will do as a novelist. There's always historic precedent for everything that's in my books. I like to tell people I put imaginary people in real circumstances. So Nan Aspinwall was the inspiration for this book, but that's where any resemblance ends. I, I can't tell you anything much about Nan. Um, I can only tell you about my fictional character, Ermagard Friedrich. And so I'm going to read the beginning of the book. Now, I told you earlier that I think, what if, what if, what if? So I thought, well, first of all, if you had a girl who wanted to travel with Buffalo Bill's Wild West and she was, say, 18, how would I as a mother respond to that? Well, I have a daughter in Nashville right now pursuing a music career. So I can kind of empathize with Ermagard's mother. You want to, what? <laughs> Alone? But, you know, so that probably fueled this too. Now, you'll have to excuse me, but I'm of a certain age, and these aren't bifocals, so I have to take them off to read to you. But I'm not going to read the beginning of the book. I'm going to read the second chapter of the book because it introduces the other character in the book. After all the years of soggy bedrolls and cold winds of howling wolves and stampeding longhorns, a feller would expect a real bed and a feather pillow to induce a near coma. But here he was, counting how many times that clock on the stairway landing gonged and thumping his pillow in a vain attempt to get comfortable again. Finally, Shep sat up and slung his legs over the side of the bed. The last thing he wanted to do was hurt anyone's feelings. After all, Buffalo Bill himself had invited Shep to stay at the house but he just couldn't sleep in this fancy bed. He got up and crossed the room to the window that looked out on the side of what was shaping up to be a magnificent ranch worthy of its renowned owner. What in the... Shep ducked behind the full-length drape and peeked out the window, concentrating on what he'd thought was movement. There, there it was, he was right. A horse and a rider just on the opposite side of the corral near the water trough. A little guy who should have known better than to linger out there in the broad moonlight if he didn't want to be seen. And by the way, he was slipping down off that horse and almost tiptoeing around. It sure seemed like he didn't want to be seen. Or maybe you've heard too many of Doc Middleton's stories these last few days. As far as Shep knew, horse thieves were generally a thing of the past around North Platte, Nebraska. Certainly no self-respecting horse thief would come near this ranch, at least not when half the cowboys in the territory were camped around the bunkhouse hoping to get hired on with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Moving slowly away from the window so no movement would be detected by the unannounced visitor or visitors should they look toward the house, Shep pulled on his shirt, slid into his jeans, and descended the ranch house stairs in his stocking feet. He exited the front door and pulled his boots on. Buttoning his shirt as he went, he slipped around the side of the house and, keeping low, headed for the row of scrub trees that bordered the cook's kitchen garden. Using the hedge for cover, Shep crouched down and watched for more movement by the barn. Whoever it was had ridden in alone, and as he watched from his vantage point, Shep decided the visitor had no evil intent. He'd walked his horse away from the water tank and hitched him to a corral post in plain sight. He was probably just trying to keep from waking anyone up. Probably another cowboy hoping to try out. More likely a cowboy clown from the size of him. Bet they call him Shorty. Whether anyone else called the new guy Shorty or not, Shep would. Of course, being six feet four inches tall, Shep could call just about anybody Shorty and get away with it. As Shep watched, Shorty unsaddled his horse and turned him into the empty corral. Whoever the guy was, he took good care of his mount. Even now, in the wee hours, he was running his hand around the horse's back, checking for burrs where the saddle had been and lifting each of the animal's hoofs to check his feet before ducking between the corral poles. Heading for the well pump, Shorty took off his hat and... Whoa! Waist-length hair tumbled out of the hat while Shorty pumped water. Shep lost his balance and sat back with a jolt. Shorty was a girl. 
So that's how my King of the Cowboys character, Shep Sterling, meets Ermagard Friedrich. And Ermagard Friedrich is not a very good name if you want to be a headliner for Buffalo Bill. And so she's come up with this name, Liberty Bell, and that's who she wants to be called in, uh, in the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. Ermagard's a privileged girl. She's grown up. Her daddy's a banker in North Platte. Her mother is a leader of society. She's a very good friend of Mrs. Buffalo Bill Cody. And her dream is for her daughter to follow in Arta Cody's footsteps and go to the finishing school that's well known that all the rich girls go to in Omaha, Nebraska. There really was a finishing school. There really was an Arta Cody. There really was a Mrs. Cody. There really was a Buffalo Bill. But there was no Liberty Bell. But that's how I do that. Um, one of the resources that really helped me write this book was a theatrical student had done her master's degree on how Buffalo Bill Cody managed to mount that production and tour with it. And I learned some amazing things. In the late 1800s, he had lighted arenas and performed at night. He had spotlights that could follow him on his white horse around the arena. And uh, just an incredible production, and I really was fascinated by just learning the inner workings of it. I think I'm a historian at heart, because I always learn about 3,000 pages more than I'll ever use in a book. But I just love immersing myself in a topic and learning as much as I can about it. Um, as you can imagine, Ermagard runs into a few challenges as the banker's daughter who is now sharing a tent at the Wild West with a Kansas, a Texas cowgirl who really is a cowgirl and who really knows what she's doing. Now Irma knows how to ride. She spent every summer on her uncle's ranch and she's taught herself and she's a natural horsewoman and so she's taught herself a lot of great tricks. But she hasn't really been all that involved necessarily in having to shovel manure whether she feels like it or not. And performing in the rain, whether she feels like it or not, and things like that. And she is kind of a spoiled brat, and so she has a lot to learn. Irma lay atop her cot and stared up at the canvas tent roof. I don't know if I'll ever get used to being called Belle, she said. From where she lay a few feet away, Helen answered, that's the name on your contract, isn't it? it still feels like I'm putting on airs to use it. Give it a few more days. Stop explaining. Annie Oakley used to be Annie Moses. Shep Sterling's mama calls him Henry. Nobody thinks they're putting on airs. Belle's a fine name. What, what did you just say? Irma sat up and looked across at Helen. I said to forget about Irma Gard and just be Belle. No, not that about Shep. You said his mama calls him Henry? Well, when they met, he told him his name was Henry. She, he told her his name was Henry, but she didn't believe him. And so now she's embarrassed. Helen cleared her throat. I thought you knew that. The program says he's from Texas. Is that even true? If the program says Shep has punched cattle in Texas, then you can believe he's punched at least two cows in the state of Texas. Show names aside, Bill tries to be as accurate as he can about things like that. But I'm right, aren't I? Shep's not really from Texas, and his real name really is Henry Mortimer. Which person are people going to talk about, read about, want to come and see at the Wild West? Ermagard Friedrich or Liberty Bell? A cowboy named Henry or a cowboy named Shep? It's not very hard to figure out, is it? And I'm no gossip, so that's all I've got to say on the subject of Henry Mortimer. But I'd love to know where you got Liberty Bell, which is, as I said, a fine show name. Did you ever play dress up or pretend when you were little? Honey, I started keeping house for my daddy and five brothers when I was 10 years old. I didn't have time to play at anything. But I know what you mean. I used to pretend my mama was just outside in the garden. It helped me get through some awful times. What must Helen think of her? A girl whose daddy essentially bought her an audition and a horse. You must think I am the world's most spoiled brat, she said. The good Lord takes people down different trails, Belle, Helen said, her voice gentle. He don't love me any less because he let me have a different childhood than you. Now hush up about all that and tell me where you got the name. Irma took a deep breath. I was about 14 when I started trying to do a combination of things I'd seen at a traveling circus that came through town. And you know how they take off their hat and take a bow and pretend the announcer is calling their name? Well, I, could just not, I just could not imagine anyone hollering, ladies and gentlemen, Ermagrard Friedrich. When Helen chuckled, Irma said, see, that's exactly what I mean. 
So I decided to make up a name. July 4th is my birthday, so the liberty part was easy. She smiled as she told the rest, and Belle was the name of one of my Aunt Laura's favorite milk cows. Aunt Laura told me Belle was French for beautiful, and I decided Liberty Belle just sounded nice. Helen laughed out loud. How can anyone who's named for a heifer feel like she's putting on airs? <laughs> you won't tell anyone that part, will you? Of course not. Helen chuckled, but it's going to be hard. Thank you. You're welcome. Belle was almost asleep when a very low moo sounded from the other side of the tent. She laughed and mooed back. So I have fun sometimes with my characters. Belle doesn't get accepted right away, and she goes through a lot of, of uh, adjusting to that kind of thing and, ha and has to be humbled and brought down a notch. But she does eventually get to be Liberty Belle. When I set out to research a book, I think the book is going to go one way. I'm what they call an intuitive writer. And the not fancy word for that is I ride by the seat of my pants. I don't outline my books. I have a character. I have a few incidents. I have a setting. And I pretty much just say, let's see where we go. And I'm off to the races. And I sit down and I start writing. That's the way I work. I've tried to do outlining. I have a whole shelf at home of craft books that tell me how to do Write your manuscript uh, from first draft to final in 30 days, and it's a method. And you sit down and you fill in the blanks, and I lasted two days with that book. And I was just so frustrated because I want to write about these people. I want to put them in the moment, in the scene. That's how I want to do it. So finally, 18 books into this project of mine of being a writer, I've given myself permission to just be who I be, and that's how I write. But what that ends up doing is I get a little surprise now and then. So I knew the history of Buffalo Bell's Wild West. I knew what year he started having women perform other than just Annie Oakley. So I kind of knew what year my book needed to be set. The other help was there actually is a, uh, a known route for the Wild West that year. So I knew where I was going to be sending my character. But I like to write books that are set in Nebraska. I ended up having a book about a troupe that spent the summer, the entire summer that year, in, on Staten Island in New York City. So I had to find out about New York City in that year. And I think it was 1886, but you'll have to forgive me because I'm already working on a book that's set in 1872, so the numbers might be wrong. But I had to learn about New York City, and uh, I can't just pick up and run off to New York and stay there until the book is finished. Wouldn't it be fun if I could do that and drop into the New York City Library? So thank God for the Internet and the Library of Congress and some of the other sites. But I learned a couple of wonderful things about New York City. The Brooklyn Bridge was new, and the Statue of Liberty was dedicated that year. And isn't that a great little serendipity when your character just happens to be named Liberty Bell? Now, one thing I know about Buffalo Bill Cody, he was a showman par excellence. And I don't know that he was part of the parade that dedicated that show or that statue. But I know that if he had a headliner named Liberty Bell, he would have made sure she was in that parade. So Liberty gets to ride in the parade that dedicates the Statue of Liberty. And I had a lot of fun with that. The other thing that I wanted to put in the book that I wasn't able to make go there was Buffalo Bill's Wild West performed in Paris at the exposition that the Eiffel Tower was built for in 1889. And if you followed me or know anything about me, you know that Paris is just about my favorite place besides Lincoln, Nebraska in the, earth, in the world. And in doing the research, I found this fabulous photograph of Buffalo Bill and his Native Americans in full dress and his entire troop on the Champs-Élysées in Paris great picture. And I thought, this is perfect. I can take him to Paris. I never made it to Paris. <laughs> I made it to the ship taking them to Paris, and that was about as far as it ever got to go in the book. So sometimes books for me have a disappointment because they don't go the way that I want them to go. But that's Unbridled Dreams. I also wanted to share with you a few words from the book that comes out next month. Um, when I found Nan and decided that this was a great story, I was working on another book. I was working actually on a contemporary book um, that was about a woman based on a woman that I know who helps people find the homes for lost tombstones. 
like if you're driving in the country and have you ever come across one and you know that sometimes our cemeteries in the country are vandalized and uh, this woman's community service is she and her husband help find where those go when they're turned into the to the sheriff's department and so I made up a story about a gal who works at a cemetery and doesn't really want to work there but she ends up on this adventure helping someone find some lost tombstones and she finds out some things about herself through that process and I've met Nan and I thought about this story and I called my agent and I said what do you think and she went oh I love it I love it I love it let me call let me call Dave let me call your editor and I got a call like the next day that said they don't want that book you're writing they want this book instead and can you do that on the same deadline Sure, not a problem. I can start from day one researching historical fiction set in a place I've never been <laughs> in a decade I don't know very much about in a world I know nothing about. Of course I can do that. So I managed, but I still have that other unfinished book to work on that's contemporary fiction, and we'll go back to that someday. But this story led me to think, what about other women in other unusual occupations of the era? And uh, what really led me to thinking about it was the publisher said, we want that one and we'll take two more if she can come up with ideas like that. So the next idea that I had come across in some of my nonfiction writing was on occasion I'd read about people going to the gold mines over the years. And every once in a while there would be a mention in a diary of a woman alone on a gold claim prospecting for gold or a woman who had become part owner in a, in a mine. And so I thought, hmm, woman gold prospector. That would be fun. And so the book that comes out next month is called A Claim of Her Own, and it's about a single woman who has, uh, is a gold prospector in Deadwood, South Dakota. As my friend Western writer Stephen Bly says, he's written a lot about that area, and I had to email Steve and ask him what kind of a gun would Maddie use because he's an expert in um, antique Western weapons, and I had picked the totally wrong gun, because this girl's got a pack. If she's going to be in Deadwood, South Dakota in 1876, she'd better have a gun or she's going to be dead. It was a pretty awful place. And the first words out of Steve's mouth were, that's a really dangerous place to send a single woman. Are you sure you want to do that? And, yeah, I want to do that. So hopefully... We will all think that worked out quite well for Maddie because she ends up on her own gold claim. But this is the beginning to that book. She's reading from a letter. Walking down the main street in Deadwood is like stepping onto Hell's front porch. It's frenzied and filthy and it's the last place on earth a man would want to bring any woman he cared about. Be patient. I know it's hard, but you have to trust me about the timing. Maddie thought Dylan was just trying to scare her when he wrote that. She thought he was just making sure she didn't take a notion to follow him up here before he was ready for her. But here she was anyway, slogging into town alongside a freighter's wagon piled high with goods and realizing that Dylan wasn't exaggerating when he wrote about Deadwood. Main Street was little more than a churning river of slops and garbage and manure. The common language seemed to be cursing and the population 100% vile men who spat tobacco and scratched themselves and smelled as if they hadn't bathed in weeks. There wasn't a real storefront for as far as she could see, at least not by her standards. Hand-painted signs improvised from old lumber or dirty sheets touted the location of laundries and stores, saloons and hotels, but most businesses were little more than large canvas tents. Frenzied and filthy, Maddie glanced down at the mud-caked hem of her skirt. Even before arriving in Deadwood, she'd encountered plenty of filth, just as predicted by the reluctant freighter she'd convinced to let her travel with his supply train. As for frenzy, two men across the way were screaming at one another over a promised order and a failure to supply. Saws and hammers, jangling harness, and rattling wagons added to the cacophony, and if that wasn't enough noise, the bullwhackers were having their share of trouble getting their teams to haul through the mire. So I have a whole new place to learn about and a whole new profession to learn about. I had to learn about how do you drive oxen and uh, things like that and how to prospect for gold. And I really enjoyed the research for this book. Of course, Gil Dylan isn't there, so she's stuck on her own and she has to make do. 
Maddie had been staying on her claim for nearly three weeks when she woke one night to the realization that someone or something was snooping around her claim. She could hear them, or it, circling the tent. Her stomach clenched, and Al hooted. Closing her eyes, she listened. Wouldn't there be some kind of animal sound if it was one of those mountain lions? What did bears do in a camp? Did they just come crashing through the canvas, or would she have some warning? Could whatever it was smell her fear? Almost holding her breath, she leaned down and felt around in the dark for the shotgun Tom had loaned her. When at first she couldn't feel it, her heart sank. Would the colt be enough? Someone cleared his throat. Instantly, she thought of Jonas, but just as quickly, she knew it wasn't him. Jonas was stealthier than a snake. He'd never make a mistake that warned his prey. She was about to have her first encounter with a claim jumper, and all of a sudden she wished she'd loaded Bessie, too, with something besides Tom English's homemade rock salt cartridges. Bessie, too, is the name of the rifle. It didn't help that Fergus McKay had an entire complement of stories about claim jumpers and love telling them around the campfire. Well, here you go, Fergus. Hopefully this will give you another story I'll live to hear. She lay back with the shotgun pointed at the tent flap. Whoever was out there was fumbling around at the opening now. She'd always felt like those ties weren't enough, but a hand, someone was sticking their hand inside. Maddie pulled the trigger. As the claim jumper roared with pain, she dropped the shotgun, grabbed her pistol, and leaping up, ripped the tent flap open. You'd better lay still, she said as she pointed the pistol. If I pull this trigger, it'll do a lot more damage than wadding and a few pellets of rock salt. So that's what's coming in a claim of her own. And the book I'm working on right now is, um, we're always working books ahead. Sometimes I even have trouble remembering my characters' names from the books I'm supposed to be talking about. But uh, it's titled 16 Brides. And uh, in case you don't know, most writers don't get to title their own books. The marketing company, the marketing people pick out the title that they think will attract the book browsers at Barnes & Noble, what makes you pick up a book. And that's all um, title and uh, cover design and things like that. Um, people who read historical fiction that I write want what they call a big head cover. Bet you can guess why they call it that, right? This is the look that that writer reader looks for in a book. If you like to read suspense novels, you may not even realize it, but this cover isn't what you look, you look for. We kind of intuitively know what the books we like kind of look like. So that's a whole different area of expertise that I'm very happy to leave to the wonderful marketing people at my publishing house. And the same goes for the title. I make tons and tons of um, suggestions sometimes, and very rarely is a book ever titled what I want it to, to call. I wanted to call the book I'm working on 16 Widows which I was told was entirely too depressing. And so we're calling it 16 Brides, and I think they're probably right. Uh, 16 Widows, it's probably a little bit. But the point is that uh, Civil War veterans, widows, could have free homesteads. If the husband was dead, the wife could have it. So that's how these women come to Nebraska. This also came from doing research on another book and coming across a newspaper article. It was dated 1902 from Gordon, Nebraska, and it says, I can't quote it directly, but you can, you can see why this stopped me and made me go, hmm. It said, the headline, Attractive Widows, and it said, today's load of widows was much better looking than the last. <laughs> they have arrived and are ready to make claims on homesteads near town. And it was a couple of, couple of paragraphs. But I thought, widows of what war? Civil War, 1902? These women are old for their era. They're not going to be homesteading, are they? And so I went on the bunny trail for that. That little scheme actually ended the person who thought of it in prison because it was not an above board thing that they were doing at the time and and I just I didn't want to go there so my widows are younger and it's 1872 and they've been widows for only about five years their husbands either died in the war or of wounds that were sustained in the Civil War but they're headed to Dawson County Nebraska in 1872 to Homestead and uh, it'll be kind of fun to see what happens I think I know what happens to all of them um, 
I have five that I'm really paying attention to of the 16. And of course, as writers do, I'm hoping the outcome is not in any way, shape, or form what they expect it to be. But sometimes characters refuse to do what I want them to do. And sometimes they just kind of stomp their foot and say, are you nuts? I never would have done that. Um, Sarah in my Sarah's Patchwork is an example of that. Sarah in Sarah's Patchwork was supposed to be a female physician. And when I went to write her story, it became apparent to me that I had created a minor character in another book who did not really have the personality of what it would have taken to have been a female physician in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1888. So Sarah kind of went, are you nuts? I never would have done that. So I had to think of a plan B for Sarah, and she becomes a nurse midwife assisting a doctor, and that made sense. I could make that work for the book. So that's the penalty of not writing by outline and not planning far enough ahead, because sometimes I do this scrambling thing of, Oy vey, you know, and I still have a deadline. So, and, and I want to be a professional about it, and I want to be a good employee for the publishers who believe in me and who are good enough to publish my books. So I want to make that deadline so that I don't cause pr trouble at the other end of book production, because there's so much else that goes into producing a book besides just the writing of the words that go between the cover. You know, there's advertising and, and you know, I, somebody has to write this blurb that goes on the back and somebody has to put it in a catalog and all of those things have to be done so far ahead of time that it's really important as an employee that I keep my head on and, and make, keep my promises. So um, that's kind of how the writing life works and those are the next two books and that's pretty much what I had planned for today. But